Let's talk about the white supremacists. First of all, let me say without fear or equivocation that any movement that burns tiki torches but doesn't serve my ties is clearly on the wrong track. Also, there's the whole hateful racist dirtbag thing that's not so good either. Secondly, in their latest rally, many of these white supremacists were chanting, Jews will not replace us. If that's true, it's a tremendous disappointment. After all, if we could replace white supremacists with Jews, the IQ of the country would rise dramatically, and more people would be doctors and lawyers, instead of sitting around in their mother's basements, pleasuring themselves while staring at pictures of Hitler and calling it date night. So, if they really cared about this country, I believe the white supremacists would rethink their Jews will not replace us philosophy and maybe change their slogan to, please replace us with Jews as quickly as possible. And here's another thing. This Hitler character these white supremacists are so fond of, I'm not sure he was as great a guy as they think he was. I mean, sure, he was a creepy little lunatic who caused the needless deaths of over 60 million people, but his career wasn't all roses. After all, the man promised Germany a thousand-year Reich and instead turned the place into a rubble-strewn vacant lot, so it's not exactly a success story. Maybe instead of waving those swastika flags of theirs, the white supremacists should wave flags that say, let's give a big ixnay to the whole Nazi business so we don't kill everyone and destroy the country like Hitler did. Hopefully they'll be smart enough to do that after we replace them with Jews. And now let's talk about blacks. I hear some people saying, okay, black men and women are among the most talented artists and athletes our country has produced. Blacks have been great thinkers like Thomas Sowell and world-renowned statesmen like Martin Luther King. But some of these radical black protesters are violent racist dirtbags themselves. So why can't white people be violent racist dirtbags too? Well, I think the white supremacists have proved that white people can indeed be violent racist dirtbags. So congratulations, white people. If I understand this philosophy right, white supremacists feel that white people are the best people ever. And in fact, I can think of many white people I admire very much. Isaac Newton was a good one. William Shakespeare. And I'm very fond of my wife as well. After all, Newton invented science and Shakespeare created great literature. And my wife is one of the nicest people you could meet. So that makes white people look pretty good. Unfortunately, when you add in a bunch of white people carrying swastikas and chanting hateful racist garbage, it lowers the white person average until we're no better than anyone else. So, in conclusion, if white supremacists want to make the white race supreme, they should stop being white supremacists. Although I'd still prefer to replace them with Jews. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. So we need also sing hunky dunky ship shaped tipsy topsy the world is a bitty zing it's a wonderful day hurrah hooray it makes me want to sing oh hurrah hooray oh hooray hurrah so this is why we can't have nice things we're one clavenless weekend and we have nazis and communists fighting with each other come on Come on, you know, I go away for three days. It's like, you just can't leave I cannot leave anymore. All right, we got Michael Knowles is going to come on. He has done a lot of uh, work reading and writing about the alt-right, so he's going to talk to us about the roots and get to the, the depth of it. But first, let us pause before we get into this obviously <laughs> depressing topic to talk about something that is good about our country, namely Stamps.com, because Stamps.com makes it so you don't have to go and wait online in front of the post office. An organization, which we should mention, does a really good job, the post office. The only problem is it's a little bit old-fashioned to have to get in your car, drive to the post office, stand there waiting online to get things that Stamps.com will put directly into your computer. With Stamps.com, you bring all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale, which automatically automatically calculates exact postage and stamps.com will even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. Right now, you can enjoy the stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Clavin. What's a Clavin? <laughs> now you're asking the tough questions. A Clavin, it's a Chinese mind disaster. That's K L A V A N, stamps.com. Enter Clavin, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Terrific product. 
good thing to have. Ugly, ugly stuff. All right. You know, one of, one of the things, one of the reasons I say that politics is frequently the opposite of religion or the opposite of spiritual wisdom is because it convinces us that the most important thing we have to do is focus on the sins of our opposition. And of course, those of you who read the gospel will know that we are instructed very carefully, pay attention to what's going on with you. And so I see all the stuff that's going on. I see the press using this to attack Trump. I see the press, uh, the, the politicians, you know, coming on, putting their fat faces on TV and trying to use evil in this death that took place. Uh, and uh, these deaths, I should say, that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia, and trying to use it to their advantage. I see that they treat the Nazi terrorists differently than they treat Muslim terrorists. I see that there's all kind of hypocrisy coming from the left, and I get that, and I'm going to talk about all of it, and that's especially, obviously, the stuff that's going on with the president. But, 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 let us start among ourselves, because we're all good conservatives here. Let us gather together and just remind ourselves these clowns are in our house, okay? These evil, satanic clowns are in our house. And it's no good saying, it's no good saying, well, they don't believe what they believe. Of course they don't believe what we believe. Of course they don't. They don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe in e pluribus unum. They don't believe in the great American tradition of bringing people in and transforming them into America through our creed that, that we conservatives are fighting so hard to defend they don't they don't believe in low taxes they don't believe in any of these any of this stuff they don't believe in america they don't believe in the whole thing that makes america what it is but they're in our house they identify themselves as right wing they vote for the people we vote for they have their slogans unite the right and all this stuff it's no good you know when the devil is in your house, you got to take care of that. It's no good saying, well, the devil is in the other guy's house too. Of course he is. But let's not mince words about it. And and by the way, by the way, one of the things I think the right wing prides itself on, and rightly so, rightly so, is we pride ourselves in remembering our Christian tradition, the fact that everything we have, everything we believe in, everything that's good about this country ultimately rests on that building block of Judeo-Christian ideas and Christ himself and on, on the things that he preached. And a lot of these right-wingers, a lot of these uh, uh, alt-right Nazis say, well, we, believe, we don't believe in Jesus, but we believe in the tradition of Christianity. Well, no, they don't. You know, no, they don't. Look, look you, cannot, you cannot believe that man is made in the image of God. You cannot believe that the Lord came and said in so many words, here are the commandments. Here are the two big commandments, love God. And here's the next one, because it's right next to it, is love your neighbor as yourself and then become a racist. You're just, you cannot go around telling God what his image should look like, okay? So these guys violate everything that we are. They are evil and they violate every, and they stand for evil and they violate everything that we are. And, we, and they're in our house. They are in our house. So, okay, we're going to talk about the left. We're going to talk about all the hypocritical and nasty things they do. But let's not mince words about it, okay? This, these guys need to be swept out and they need to be discarded. And they need to, we need to turn our back on them and walk away. And by the way, you know, if, if in some moment of anger, if in some moment of personal, uh, you know, problems or something, something they've said has uh, made sense to you, or you've gone online and said something that sort of links you to them. That was yesterday. Today, walk away, walk away. This is, these guys are not the good guys. They are the bad guys and they're in our house. We have to reject them. So what happened? Uh, you know, let's just go quickly over this thing. They have us a, a park in Charlottesville. This is not uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. This is Charlottesville, Virginia, which has that beautiful, uh, that's where UVA is. And it's a beautiful city. I've been there. Um, and uh, which Jefferson designed and all this stuff. Anyway, they have a, a park with a statue, it has Robert E. Lee statue. They had a vote to get rid of the Robert E. Lee statue and rename this park from Lee Park to Emancipation Park, celebrating obviously the emancipation. Personally, I'm always against removing this kind of Soviet idea that you remove the past if you don't like it, but it's their town, it's not our town. You know, that if, if we're conservatives, we believe in federalism, we believe all the power should be concentrated on the individual and then locally and then the state and only at the last, in the last necessity, should it go up to the, to Washington. It's their town. If they want to do this, that's up to them. These guys came in from out of town to start trouble. They showed up loaded for bear. They showed up armed. They showed up with helmets. They showed up with weapons and, and the left came out to protest them. Now the left, 
you know, the, the, another problem for us on the right is that the good folks, the religious folks who are just saying, love your neighbor, you know, we reject white supremacy, never mind our politics, whatever they are. They're also standing with the, the Antifa guys and the Antifa guys are fascists. They are fascists. So while we were getting ready for the show, Donald Trump came out and made a, a second statement. And we're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, let's play the statement that he made at the time. He was honoring some veterans and he paused hearing about what's going on. And he gave what seemed to be a prepared statement. So this is uh, cut number one. And this is what has caused all the anti-Trump controversy. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides, on many sides. It's been going on for a long time in our country. Not Donald Trump, not Barack Obama. This has been going on for a long, long time. It is no place in America. What is vital now is a swift restoration of law and order and the protection of innocent lives. Now, so he said the hatred is on all sides and this drives the left crazy. How can you compare? How can you make moral equivalence to between these Nazis and wonderful, lovely people like Antifa, who they must be anti-fascists right in their name while they're hitting you over, while they're wearing a, a balaclava and hitting you over the head with a stick. And the Black Lives Matter people who include people who say, you know, pigs in a blanket, cook them up, whatever they say, who incite violence and who have committed violence against police officers in the name of their loving peace. So, you know, Trump is right as far as it goes. He's as He's right as far as it goes. Obviously, there was this stuff during his campaign where he didn't step up and immediately condemn David Duke. Uh, people felt it wasn't dog whistles. They just felt he was being too soft on it. So they wrote nuts. And I just want to play. I, I want to remind you. Well, let me let me do this in order. All right. First, here's Peter Alexander. What is he? Um, I can't remember. CBS, I think. Um, I think he's CBS. But NBC. Sorry. NBC News. Right. Uh, Peter. And, and he's interviewing Vice President Mike Pence. And he's like, can't imagine what Trump could have meant. You know, here he is. He said on many sides, name those sides. What are the sides? Well, look, as I said today, we, we condemn in the strongest terms uh, the hate and, and violence advocated by groups like white supremacists, neo-Nazis and, and their ilk. But that's one side. What's the other side when he says on many sides? Well, as you look throughout the course of recent years, we've seen protests turn violent. We've seen fringe groups use peaceful protest environment to bring violence, in some cases, against police officers. But only one group results. yesterday, with respect, with only one group yesterday, Mr. Vice President, killed an American. And we're bringing the full weight uh, of the federal government to bear on investigating and prosecuting that individual uh, for that heinous act that took the life of that innocent woman. I will tell you, Peter, that I take issue with the fact that many in the media are spending more time criticizing how the president addressed the issue But this is yesterday. Orrin Hatch and Cory Gardner, sir. Well, it's not me. Well, I'm reading their quotes. Many in the media have spent an awful lot of time focusing on what the president said and criticisms of what the president said instead of criticizing those who brought that hatred and violence to the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia. All right, so let's, let's take a look and listen to what Trump has now said. He came out this morning with a new statement. I haven't heard it yet, so I'll hear it for the first time. Racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. We are a nation founded on the truth that all of us are created equal. We are equal in the eyes of our creator. We are equal under the law. And we are equal under our constitution. Those who spread violence in the name of bigotry strike at the very core of America. Okay, that's clear enough. I think, you know, they, are they going to pick apart that? I don't know. I mean, the whole thing is, this. It's the whole thing that's so bothersome is, what other side could there possibly, you know, who else is hateful? How could you call these other people hateful? Gay, uh, Cheryl Gay Stolberg, a New York Times reporter, was there on the scene and she tweeted out, you know, that she was surprised at the, how, that, that the Antifa protesters were also filled with, as she put it, hate-filled violence. And the Twitter reverse just 
piled on top of her until, of course, like all leftists, she apologized to Stalinist show trials and she apologized for what she said. But it's just true. And let us not forget our former president, while we're picking on Donald Trump, every word that comes out of his mouth has to be, you know, turned against him and made into a big thing. But while we're picking on him, let us not forget our former president and how he reacted when a Muslim shouting Allahu Akbar opened fire in Fort Hood in 2009 and killed 13 people. Let's hear how the, the powerful statement against Islamist terrorism that came out of that president. I want to begin by offering an update on the tragedy that took place yesterday at Fort Hood. This morning I met with FBI Director Mueller and the relevant agencies to discuss their ongoing investigation into what caused one individual to turn his gun on fellow servicemen and women. We don't know all the answers yet, and I would caution against jumping to conclusions until we have all the facts. So, so how would it have been, I mean, just transpose that. How would it have been if Donald Trump had gotten up and said, let's not rush to judgment. Let's not rush to judgment on who is to blame here until we have all the facts. And by the way, just to finish this thought, remember when the cop started bothering uh, the, the Harvard, the black Harvard professor in Cambridge? Remember, so he said, don't rush to judgment. Don't make any decisions to, until, wait until we get all the facts. And here's what Obama said then, same year. I don't know, not having been there and not seeing all the facts, what role race played in that. But I think it's fair to say, number one, any of us would be pretty angry. Number two, that the Cambridge police uh, acted stupidly. So, so all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, you know, Trump has made some mistakes about this. If, if I were... If I were in his shoes, what I would have said is there's hatred on all sides, but some of these guys who support me have to know that they're not helping me or my administration. My administration does not support this. I'm not the friend of these philosophies. You know, if you want to make America great again, because let's look, you know, America has has had gr greater days than it's having right now. And during those days, there were injustices that need to be put away. We want a new greatness. We want a great a greatness that doesn't have that stuff. There's nothing wrong with Trump saying that. And there's nothing that was nothing that would hurt his efforts and his agenda for him to come out and say, look, there's about 10 of these guys in the country. There are not that many of them. Even even here, they do a lot of work. The, the These right wing fascists do a lot of work to make themselves seem like there are more of them than there are. There aren't that many of them. They didn't put Donald Trump over the top. They're not the reason he won the election. He can obviously just say, look, if, if you actually favor my administration, you have to not be this guy. Put it away. The guy who really bugged me of, of all of these people was Michael Signer, the mayor of Charlottesville. And of course, I feel for him. It's a horrible thing to happen to his city. But he basically laid this directly at Trump's door. Let's listen to this. Well, look at the campaign he ran. I mean, look, look at the intentional courting, both on the one hand of all these white supremacists, white nationalist group like that, anti-Semitic groups. And then look on the other hand, the, the repeated failure to step up, condemn, denounce, silence, you know, put to bed all those different efforts, just like we saw yesterday. I mean, this is not hard. There's, you know, there's two words that need to be said over and over again, domestic terrorism and white supremacy. That is exactly what we saw on display this weekend. And we just aren't seeing leadership from the White House. We certainly are going to see leadership from cities like Charlottesville, from mayors, from, from leaders all around the country, left and right, Republicans and Democrats, if there's an issue that can unite this country, that this can be a turning point for this democracy. I think it just happened right now this weekend in Charlottesville. You know, I, to be honest, it doesn't matter much to me whether He's already on the on the sidelines, I think, of so many issues, but the country is going to move ahead. This will be a turning point for the country to overcome this stuff, just like we've overcome these challenges in our past. And I think it's happening right now as we speak. Mr. And by the way, again, I know when you hear that and you think domestic terrorism, white supremacism, how come these guys aren't as fast? He's a Democrat. Why aren't they as quick to say domestic terrorism, Islamist uh, fundamentalism? Why was Trump controversial when he did say that? But you know, again, let it go. These guys are in our house. We have to face them. We got it. We have to purge these people from anything that even looks like our movement. We have to announce and say repeatedly, you know, I know it's not fair. I know it's not fair. And the reason it's not fair, the reason it's not fair is because leftism is racism. Leftism with its identity politics is now 
wholly infested with racism. We're not. Just like I said before, you can't fight for free speech by silencing other people's speech. You cannot fight for the Constitution and America and and be a racist. You cannot be a right-wing racist. The two things simply do not go together, and anything that looks like that has to be purged out of the movement. The thing that bothered me about Signer, though, is listen to my pal Doug McElwee, the great Fox News street reporter. He was out there on the scene. Listen to his experience with the police in Charlottesville. And before you lay this at Trump's house, mayor and, and Governor Terry McAuliffe, listen to this, what McElwee says about the cops. When I got out of my car yesterday in Charlottesville for the first time at about 1030 yesterday morning, you knew this was a bad scene and that bad things were going to be happening because people were congregating at Lee Park, at Emancipation Park, wearing helmets, body armor, carrying big, heavy sticks. Nobody was intent upon peace here from either side. People were intent on causing havoc and causing damage. And even as wounded were being brought out of the park, the police were sitting idly by. Uh, I was standing by a, a cordoned off area where the police had set up as a staging area, the state police had set up, and they said, you can come in here, this is a safe area. But when the tear gas started to fly, thrown by protesters, the police themselves began to evacuate that. I asked the guy who was in charge, I said, where are you going? He said, we're leaving. It's too dangerous. They had an opportunity to nip this thing in the bud, and they chose not to. And that's the state police, but you know, the thing is, when you, have, when you know these people are coming, why are they protesting anywhere near each other? Why not just put them in different places? That is the way you avoid these, these problems. So I would like to be hearing from Terry McAuliffe, and Terry McAuliffe is out defending the police. It really sat, look, it's not the individual cop's job. It's not the cop on the beats problem. It's where the orders are coming from. Where was the order to stand down? Where was the order to let these people come together? We're going to have Michael Knowles after the break, but first let us pause in what I admit is a dark uh, subject to have a little bit more brightness because there's so much, God, you know, there's so much about this country. These guys are so few. There's so few. And when we, when the rest of us turn on each other in their name, they are getting some of the stuff that they want. You know, when we, when the decent people start fighting with each other over these clowns, uh, they are getting some of the stuff we want. Always good to pause and remember that uh, capitalism is still working well. The job market is working well. And you can get great snacks with Nature Box. I mean, there you go. It is a good, it is a good thing. If you are like me, when you're up late at night, you, that's when you start to hit what's ever in the closet, what's ever in the uh, cupboard. You start eating whatever is there. A lot of times, maybe not so good. With Nature Box, you send away, they will send you snacks, and they're all, they have, they're made out of better stuff. They tell you, you know, the calories and what's in and what's involved. They have over a hundred snacks that taste good and are actually better for you. All the snacks are made from high quality, simple ingredients, which means no artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners. You can feel good about what you're eating, and they are, they're good, they are good. I've, I've talked before about the one, uh, the kettle corn with coffee. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just talking about it makes me a little bit, uh, you'll, uh, you'll be happy if I don't just walk away. French vanilla, almond granola, whole wheat chocolate chip cookie bites, and they come in these bags so you can tell how much you're getting. So simple, go to naturebox.com, you choose the snacks you want, and Naturebox will deliver them right to your door. I can promise you, if you just go on the website, you will do this thing because you'll see the pictures and they look so good. There's no risk. If you ever try a snack you don't like, don't eat it. Nature Box will replace it for free. And you can save even more right now. Nature Box is offering my fans three free snacks with your first order. When you go to naturebox.com slash Clavin. I have a question. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you asked. You made me a question I can actually answer. K-L-A-V-A-N, naturebox.com slash Clavin for three Free snacks with your first order, naturebox.com slash Clavin. It's good stuff. You will like it. All right, we got a break from Facebook and YouTube where you get free video for a while, but then if you want to watch the rest of the show, you got to come to thedailywire.com and subscribe. You can come over to thedailywire.com and listen, but if you want to see the whole show, you can just subscribe. That way you get in the mailbag. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month. You get all your questions answered, your personal problems solved, and if you subscribe, for a year, at a lousy hundred bucks for the year, you get the leftist tears tumbler. Come on, it's worth it. All right, let's. Uh, we'll, we'll see you on the other side. All right, Knowles, have we got him? 
the great and powerful Michael Knowles. There we are. Hey, it's good to see you. You know, I have to thank you. You have Uh-oh. you have given me some really terrible assignments before uh- <laughs> Southside with you, yeah. Barry, so on. I'm I'm really glad you did not send me to Charlottesville this weekend. <laughs> that would have just that would have been worse than Southside with you. So I I just like to thank you on the show. It would have been it would have been a toss up, Southside or you, or having <laughs> yeah. your head cracked in by a That's bunch true. of crazy. Fair enough. <laughs> how's how's your show going? The uh, show's going well. I want yeah. to thank everybody for listening. We rose up pretty high in the charts and have been doing shockingly well. I figured we would have been canceled by now, but thanks to viewers like you, somehow I, I still I, have a job. I've, I've tried my best to get you canceled. And, <laughs> and, and that I have to remind people, you have to go on. You cannot let this man, look, look at this guy's face. Look at I mean, this mug. You cannot let this man rise above my show. <laughs> and it's all about the reviews. You got to go on iTunes and review my show and give it good reviews so you can humiliate this man as he this, so, obvi- you so obviously deserves. Don't I mean, you? <laughs> <laughs> so you have written a lot and, and wrote, you wrote a really excellent piece a, a long time, a while back, for the Daily Wire about these. Uh, what do we call them? I, I almost hate to call them the alt right because it doesn't mean anything. The, the word has been watered down to mean nothing. Yeah. They've sort of done it. It's a weird alliance between these guys and the media to make this term so ambiguous that they pull people in. And this this is the cleverness of them. It's why they called their rally "Unite the Right." Hmm. This rally was just neo Confederates, neo Nazis, white nationalists. Very, they're very a small group of people and centered around those ideas, but they called it Unite the Right because then people like Richard Spencer and so on get to mainstream themselves and insinuate themselves in the conservative movement that booted them out 50 years ago. Right. We, they did, right? This is These are the guys that William Buckley chased out of the temple, basically. That's right. And they've always been around a little bit. You know, the uh, Buckley purged them, purged the Bershers and, and other racists and anti-Semites. And they've kind of come back a little bit. You know, there was always this Buchananism toyed around with this a lot. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of other people. John Derbyshire has written racist articles. Yep. Uh, uh, Peter Brimelow has veered into that territory. And for decades now, there have been people like Jared Taylor, my fellow Yale, who's a white supremacist, white white nationalist. I think is fair. He is uh, unique, I think, among them because he's actually not anti-Semitic. He's just a Ethno state advocate and wants a white country and all those sort of things. Uh, not the same cannot be said of some of these other guys. There's Theodore Beale who goes by Vox Day. Oh yeah, he, he's one. He he utters the 14 words about protecting white people. What, and are, what are the 14 words? The 14 words are. Let me see if I remember this from summer camp. Okay. It's uh, <laughs> we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. It's often paired with 88 which stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet H, which stands for Heil Hitler, of course. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, and, and other writers, too. Sam Francis, the old right-wing writer, he called for a white racial consciousness. P- Paul Ramsey is a YouTube guy, white supremacist, questions the Holocaust. Uh, What's really interesting about these guys is just like the progressives, they're going backwards. You know, they're going back to this primitive idea. I mean, ever since Jesus, basically, the idea has been that we that great ideas transcend nationalism and transcend race. At least since Jesus, it's been that idea. They're going back into this primitivism. These guys are evidence that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. This is <laughs> yeah, the, seriously yeah. because they're not totally stupid and they're not totally uneducated. They are a little bit stupid and lightly educated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They've read some things, but not. But without a lot of context, they position themselves as defenders of Western culture, Western civilization. I think they know very little about those two things. And as, as a result, their views can seem attractive. A guy like Richard Spencer, who's kind of become the head of this thing, he runs alt- altright.com, the National Policy Institute, which is white nationalist. He's a good looking guy. He's articulate. And he seems educated to the uneducated. Uh-huh. He's not a stupid guy. He was in a PhD program at Duke, and that that's what that's what's worrisome. It's, it's David Duke University, right? That's David Duke. Oh, Duke no, University. Right, the other right. Duke. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, yeah it's a correspondence course, anyway. <laughs> yeah. But with what it, it's attractive, it's subtle, it's uh, tempting, much like the devil. <laughs> so it's very, you know confuses information <laughs> right. that way, and as a result, I think particularly young people, particularly uh, that right wing set of internet trolls can be brought over to them. You know, Andrew Anglin, the guy who runs Daily Storm, or this disgusting website, which is just a neo-Ku Klux Klan thing, 
He says that he's the king of the trolls, which makes this fight personal, buddy. Absolutely. Because back when you were just neo-Nazis, I was angry. But now you're claiming my people. This is <laughs> not good. <laughs> you are. Listen, I think we all acknowledge that you are king of the trolls. I appreciate it. This is it. like Game of Thrones. You guys are going to have to fight it out with, like, dragons. When two ethereal armies go to <laughs> battle, particularly with dragons, side with Michael. Always right. side with Michael. <laughs> you know right. how the story turns out. <laughs> so, that, But there's this worry. that Some young people went to this stupid thing in Charlottesville. There's a guy, he's a college president, college Republican president at Washington State University, James Alsip. He's a YouTuber guy. He went there in, in solidarity with these guys. He's the, the guy who mowed down the poor woman and 19 other people was 20 years old, right. threw his life away, probably had more testosterone than sense. And, and the other strange thing about this movement is that it's not just hillbillies. Yeah, it, you know, of the, course, of course. Yeah. There are a lot of roots. A Andrew Anglin, the Storm, Daily Stormer guy, says that he, his largest source of traffic and donations is Silicon Valley. Really? It's not Appalachia. Now, who knows? I mean, the guy's a liar and a troll, yeah, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. There are these roots of neo-reaction that came out of Silicon so, Valley. So wait, let's talk about the young, the young aspect of this for a minute. Though, sure. Because I, I, have to, I have to believe, I mean, I, I, obviously there's no study of it, but I have to believe that part of the appeal to young people is shattering the pieties. I mean, when you see a guy... Uh, fired from Google for basically saying, hey, could you please allow a little bit of uh, alternate opinions in here? And they go, yeah, you're fired. That that there, it becomes, I mean, I always used to say this about John Darbyshire too, is that it, it becomes glamorous to fight the power. I mean, it's kind of like Satan in Paradise Lost. You know, he's up against this massive power. It becomes kind of romantic to precisely. stand up against it, even if you're utterly in the wrong. That's precisely right. And I think that, I don't think we should condescend and patronize these young people and say, oh, you've got a lot to learn, young fella. Mm -hmm. and, but n nevertheless, y you have to be careful when your ideas are forming and you don't quite know where you stand and you have a little bit of knowledge or a little bit of education or a little bit of passion because you're watching Brandon Ike get fired or this guy at Google get fired and you're seeing your grades lowered because you're on the right. It creates reactionaries. That's what this school out of Silicon Valley is. It's a it's a reactionary thing, mm -hmm. and uh, you really ought to calm down, or you, or you can ruin your life. The internet is forever, and yeah. and the extreme of this is a guy who who mowed down a woman and killed her. He'll he'll go to jail if there's any justice. Uh, that it's a it's a dangerous thing you're playing with. The memes are fun. Pepe's fun. Yelling about Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan is a lot of fun. I. I Embrace all of those things. Yeah, sure. But you are you are playing with fire if you're playing around with these guys. I, I mean, this is always my argument with Milo Yiannopoulos. He thinks he's being ironic, but evil eats irony. I mean, evil is like, irony is a snack for evil. I mean, you can be ironic about it all you want, and it's, it's a good thing to make fun of the devil. But basically, if you are participating in this stuff and thinking it's glamorous or, or funny, uh, the devil will just, he'll have you for lunch. If you live your life ironically, yeah. you, there's, there's no difference. <laughs> there right. is no difference. Right, difference between right. what's ironic and yeah. what's earnest and milo did inestimable damage to the to the right in this country and to the conservative movement yeah. by mainstreaming these guys he ostensibly wrote this article uh the establishment conservatives guide to the alt-right right. which my article is is refuting and and uh, responding to but he uh, on the one hand he said racists are a fringe in this movement and then he said here are the founders of this movement everyone's a racist <laughs> or, it's a ra or a neo-nazi or something you know to go back also for a minute I, and i really do want to talk about this because it's it's important to me personally this idea of education and a little bit of education one of the things that i've noticed repeatedly with these guys is that they have read a couple of great books and they can quote from them Nietzsche and things like that, people who are really important in the history of Western culture. But they're looking at them without any context, without any, I mean, if you've read Nietzsche and you've re never read Dostoevsky, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're not and so if you're, looking, if you're looking at a mountain and you're saying, oh, that's the highest peak and you don't look around you and know that there are mountains that are 10 times higher, uh, you really don't know what you're talking about. And it has this atmosphere of, of sounding uh, educated 
when it's truly, truly not, and when you read them in depth, you see that they really don't have a depth of education. I think that's why the objectivist society of America, the average and median age, is probably around 17. Because <laughs> when, you, yeah. when you pick up Ayn Rand, this happened to me, you pick up Ayn Rand at 17, you say, oh my gosh, I understand everything now. Right. And then you think about it for a couple of years and you say, ah, oh, no, I don't, a lot of that doesn't make any sense. Uh, same thing with these books, when you read Nietzsche or uh, so on and so forth. But they, they talk about defending Western civilization, defending Western culture. There's something glamorous about that. There's something important and urgent about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. But what are you defending? Right. What, are, what is Western culture? What is Western civilization? What is it looking at? What is it geared toward? And what are you looking at? And what are you geared toward? Right. Something tells me it's not the same thing. Right. A really, really good point. You can't defend Western civilization by violating all of its norms. <laughs> Michael Knowles, The Michael Knowles Show is coming on soon, and he'll continue uh, talking about this. Thanks a lot, Michael. It's really interesting. Good to be here. All right. Good See you, Drew. Man, oh man! You know we got You know what we should play? Did 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 I send you that cut from the uh, nineteen forty seven? Mil the military put this out after the war, after World War II, uh, to to get people away from these philosophies. I just want to play you this for a little bit. It's corny. This is from nineteen forty seven. Uh, a guy making the kind of speech that these right wingers are making, uh, and the military sort of trying to teach people how to stay away from it. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? Now I... I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. That's all I seem to know what he's talking about. What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. You'll find do you out believe in that kind of talk? Well, that all makes pretty good sense to me. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know Masons? What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? Please, I hear I love that. So wait a minute. The Masons. I didn't, I didn't mind when you hate the blacks and the Jews, but now you hate the Masons. I'm a Mason. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's funny because it's old fashioned and corny, but it is so, so true that, like, you know, this stuff turn will turn on you as fast as it will turn on anybody else. You know, it will it'll turn on, you know, whatever you think you are, whatever you think protected class you think you're in. One day you let these guys in and one day they come after. To you. All right, we have a new uh, feature today, our crappy culture. There it is. <laughs> I love it. We've even misspelled crappy and culture, which I think is <laughs> excellent, excellent music. Good job. Uh, you know, this is, it is kind of a, a, day, a tough day. It's a tough day for comedy. Let's put it that way. It is, it is really a tough day for comedy. We haven't even mentioned uh, the two police officers who died in a chopper crash while trying to patrol this, uh, these events in Charlottesville. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't want to go off too far, uh, too far afield. And I want to talk a little bit in our crappy culture. One of the things that is crappy about our culture is the mainstreaming, the mainstreaming of bigotry from the left almost exclusively that has given these clowns on our side, our e evildoers, it has given our evildoers shelter, okay? Here is a piece, Tom Knighton at PJ Media linked to this piece, it's from the College Fix, and the College Fix covers, uh, you know, bad things that are happening in colleges. Stanford University, okay, this is one of the premier universities in the country. Stanford University is slated to offer a class this fall called White Identity Politics, during which students will, quote, survey the field of whiteness studies and discuss the, quote, possibilities of abolishing whiteness, according to the course descriptions. Citing pundits who say, quote, the 2016 presidential election marks the rise of white identity politics in the United States. The upper level anthropology seminar will draw from the field of whiteness studies and from contemporary writings that push whiteness studies 
in new directions. Questions to be posed throughout the semester include, does white identity politics exist? And how is a concept like white identity to be understood in relation to white nationalism, white supremacy, white privilege, and whiteness. Students will consider the perils and possibilities of different political practices according to the course descriptions, including abolishing whiteness or coming to terms with white identity. The course will be taught by instructor John Patrick Moran. Reached by email, Moran, Moran declined to comment. I'll bet he did. Instead, directing the college fix to Stanford Communications Office, Ernest Miranda, a spokesman for Stanford, told the fix via email that abolishing whiteness is a concept put forward in the 1990s by a number of white historians. Their belief was that if other white people would, like them, stop identifying politically as white, it would help end inequalities. Well, let me ask you this then. Okay, if white people are supposed to stop identifying as white, are black people supposed to stop identifying as black? Because if black people stop identifying as black, the Democratic Party would disappear. If the Democratic Party could stop, would stop convincing people to identify according to their race and according to their sex and according to their identity, the Democrat Party would disappear. Its policies don't work. Its cities are cesspools for the people they're supposed to help. I mean, go on, look online at any place where uh, blacks are being shot down, where they're living in squalor, where they're living in desperate situations. See who's been running that city since like, you know, 1203. You know, the, these places like Chicago, Baltimore, St. Louis, you know, they almost never have Republican governors or mayors. You know, that the fact that this philosophy, this progressive Democrat socialist philosophy has failed everywhere and has failed the people it's supposed to help is very, very well established. So the only thing they have is this grievance politics. Why on earth, why on earth would black lives matter? I mean, if you if you if a Democrat politician stands up and he says all lives matter, he gets shouted down. We've seen it. He gets booed off the stage. So what is it? that makes Richard Spencer and these white Nazis, what is it that deprives them of their legitimacy in that world? What is it? Once you say that black people have a right to rise up as black people, why don't white people have a right to rise up as white people? You are eating the results of your own logic. I mean, it is, it, was it Antonin Scalia who said that uh, if you want to get rid of racist you know, preferences. You have to stop preferring people on the basis of races. He was attacking affirmative action. Of course, affirmative action is wrong. Of course, it's wrong. It's wrong. See, this is the problem with the left. We're always talking about whether things work or not. They always have us in these kind of uh, conversations about, well, does this improve things? Does this make life better? Does socialism make life fair? Socialism is wrong per se because the government has no right to take your property. It's your property. It has no right. It's stealing. Just because the government does it doesn't make it any less stealing. It is wrong per se. Racism is wrong per se, identifying people according to their color of their skin is wrong per se. We who believe in God know why it's wrong, but everybody knows it's wrong. We know why it's wrong. We know we were made in the image of God. We know the image of God has different colors, has different races, comes from different places. We know that we are meant to love one another. We know because we are people who believe in God. But even if you don't believe, you know you know this to be true down in your heart that the, the idea of attacking somebody not for what he does but for what he is is wrong so why is it that the left has been allowed to mainstream this idea if a white cop kills a black guy it's immediately a racial issue but who says it was who says it was you know how do you, do you have proof do you have evidence that he was a racist instead they have accepted i've said this before they have accepted the values of the people they think are oppressors and expect by those values to get to a different place they think that there's been so much bigotry against black people and god knows there certainly has in this country and in all countries but it, but this country has had a specific problem with it there's been so much bigotry against black people that all we got to do is have some bigotry against white people like they're doing at stanford and the scales are going to balance but all the bigotry all the bigotry goes in one side of the scale that is the way it works and the reason is simple it has to do it goes back to robert e lee in a way it goes back to the way the past works the past history writes itself indelibly into the fabric of reality. Every sin, every evil, every bad thing that's happened writes itself indelibly into the fa fabric of what is going to happen next. Okay, so there's no getting away from the way that evil misshapes the generations. But 
Each person who is born is given a soul of his own with which to start the world anew. Okay, each person is innocent. So when you say I'm going to fix the bigotry of the past against blacks by being bigoted against white people, you are harming innocence. The devil does not care who does the hating as long as the hating gets done. That is the thing. So when, so when you have affirmative action and you exclude white people, you're excluding innocent white people. It's not the guys who did the crime. The guys who did the crime are gone. You cannot change the past. The only way to change the past is through forgiveness and grace and letting things go. And C.S. Lewis said it best. He said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive, okay? So it's not easy, I know it's not easy, but it is the only way forward. And these guys who think that Black Lives Matter, saying Black Lives Matter is not racist, it all goes in the same pot, it's all racism. The mainstreaming of racism is part of what is making our crappy culture. Hopefully better days ahead, but I feel that there's some troubled waters we're gonna have to get through first. We will get through them. It's a great country, it's a great people, it is a great idea, and it will not go down easily to clowns like these. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. We will talk some more tomorrow. Oh, town. It's not our town. You know, that if, if we're conservatives, we believe in federalism, we believe all the power should be concentrated on the individual and then locally and then the state and only at the last, in the last necessity, should it go up to the, to Washington. It's their town. If they want to do this, that's up to them. These guys came in from out of town to start trouble. They showed up loaded for bear. They showed up armed. They showed up with helmets. They showed up with weapons. And, and the left came out to protest them. Now, the left... You know, the, the, another problem for us on the right is that the good folks, the religious folks who are just saying, love your neighbor, you know, we reject white supremacy, never mind our politics, whatever they are, they're also standing with the, the Antifa guys. And the Antifa guys are fascists. They are fascists. So while we were getting ready for the show, Donald Trump came out and made a, a second statement. And we're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, let's play the statement that he made at the time, he was honoring some veterans and he paused hearing about what's going on and he gave what seemed to be a prepared statement. So this is uh, cut number one and this is what has caused all the anti-Trump controversy. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry and violence on many sides, on many sides. It's been going on for a long time in our country. Not Donald Trump, not Barack Obama. This has been going on for a long, long time. It is no place in America. What is vital now is a swift restoration of law and order and the protection of innocent lives. Now, so he said the hatred is on all sides, and this drives the left crazy. How can you compare? How can you make moral equivalents to between these Nazis and wonderful, lovely people like Antifa, who they must be anti-fascists right in their name while they're hitting you, over, while they're wearing a, a balaclava and hitting you over the head with a stick. And the Black Lives Matter people who include people who say, you know, pigs in a blanket, cook them up, whatever they say, who incite violence and who have committed violence against police officers in the name of their loving peace. So, you know, Trump is right as far as it goes. He's, as, he's right as far as it goes. Obviously, there was this stuff during his campaign where he didn't step up and immediately condemn David Duke. Uh, people felt it wasn't dog whistles. They just felt he was being too soft on it. So they go nuts. And I just want to play. I, I want to remind you. Well, let me let me do this in order. All right. First, here's Peter Alexander. What is he? Um, I can't remember. CBS, I think. Um, I think he's CBS. But NBC. Sorry. NBC News. Right. Uh, Peter. And, and he's interviewing Vice President Mike Pence. And he's like, can't imagine what Trump could have meant. You know, here he is. He said on many sides, name those sides. What are the sides? Well, look. 
the great and powerful Michael Knowles. There we are. Hey, it's good to see you. You know, I have to thank you. You have Uh-oh. you have given me some really terrible assignments before <laughs> Southside with you, yeah. Barry, so on. I'm I'm really glad you did not send me to Charlottesville this weekend. <laughs> that would have just that would have been worse than Southside with you. So I I just like to thank you on the show. It would have been it would have been a toss up, Southside or you, or having <laughs> yeah. your head cracked in by a That's bunch true. of crazy. That's true. Fair enough. <laughs> how's how's your show going? The uh, show's going well. I yeah. want to thank everybody for listening. We rose up pretty high in the charts and have been doing shockingly well. I figured we would have been canceled by now, but thanks to viewers like you, somehow I still have a job. I've, I've tried my best to get you canceled. And, <laughs> and, and that I have to remind people, you have to go on, you cannot let this man, look, look at this guy's face. Look at I mean, this mug. You cannot let this man rise above my show, <laughs> and it's all about the reviews. you got to go on iTunes and review my show and give it good reviews so you can humiliate this man as he this, so, obvi- so obviously deserves. Don't I mean, you? <laughs> <laughs> so you have written a lot, and, and wrote, you wrote a really excellent piece a, a long time, a while back, for the Daily Wire about these. Uh, what do we call them? I, I almost hate to call them the alt right because it doesn't mean anything. The, the word has been watered down to mean nothing. Yeah. They've sort of done it. It's a weird alliance between these guys and the media to make this term so ambiguous that they pull people in. And this this is the cleverness of them. It's why they called their rally "Unite the Right." Hmm. This rally was just neo Confederates, neo Nazis, white nationalists. Very, they're very a small group of people and centered around those ideas, but they called it Unite the Right because then people like Richard Spencer and so on get to mainstream themselves and insinuate themselves in the conservative movement that booted them out 50 years ago. Right. We, they did, right? This is These are the guys that William Buckley chased out of the temple, basically. That's right. And they've always been around a little bit. You know, the uh, Buckley purged them, purged the Bershers and, and other racists and anti-Semites. And they've kind of come back a little bit. You know, there was always this Buchananism toyed around with this a lot. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of other people. John Derbyshire has written racist articles. Uh, uh, Peter Brimelow has veered into that territory. And for decades now, there have been people like Jared Taylor, my fellow Yale, who's a white supremacist, white white nationalist, I think is fair. He is uh, unique, I think, among them because he's actually not anti-Semitic. He's just a ethno state advocate and wants a white country and all those sort of things uh not the same cannot be said of some of these other guys there's theodore beale who goes by vox day oh yeah he, he's one he he utters the 14 words about protecting white people what, and are, what are the 14 words the 14 words are let me see if i remember this from summer camp okay. it's uh, <laughs> we must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children it's often paired with 88 which stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet H, which stands for Heil Hitler, of course. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, and, and other writers, too. Sam Francis, the old right wing writer. <laughs> now you're asking the tough questions of Clavin. It's a Chinese mind disaster. That's K L A V A N, stamps.com. Enter Clavin, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Terrific product. Good thing to have. Ugly, ugly stuff. All right. Terrific. You know, one of one of the things, one of the reasons I say that politics is frequently the opposite of religion or the opposite of spiritual wisdom is because it convinces us that the most important thing we have to do is focus on the sins of our opposition. And of course, those of you who read the gospel will know that we are instructed very carefully, pay attention to what's going on with you. And so I see all the stuff that's going on. I see the press using this to attack Trump. I see the press, uh, the the politicians, you know, coming on, putting their fat faces on TV and trying to use evil in this death that took place. uh, And uh, these deaths, I should say, that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia, and trying to use it to their advantage. I see that they treat the Nazi terrorists differently than they treat Muslim terrorists. I see that there's all kind of hypocrisy coming from the left. And I get that. And I'm going to talk about all of it. And that's especially, obviously, the stuff that's going on with the president. But, but, but let us start among ourselves, because we're all good conservatives here. Let us gather together and just remind ourselves, these clowns are in our house, okay? These evil, satanic clowns are in our house. And it's no good saying, it's no good saying, well, they don't believe what they believe. Of course, they don't believe what we believe. Of course they don't. They don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe in e pluribus unum. They don't believe in the great American tradition of bringing people in and transforming them into America through our creed that that we conservatives are fighting so hard to defend. They don't they don't believe in low taxes. They don't believe in any of these any of this stuff. They don't believe in America. They don't believe in the whole thing that makes America what it is. But 
they're in our house. They identify themselves as right wing. They vote for the people we vote for. They have their slogans, unite the right and all this stuff. It's no good. You know, when the devil is in your house, you got to take care of that. It's no good saying, well, the devil is in the other guy's house too. Of course he is. But let's not mince words about it. And, and by the way, by the way, one of the things I think the right wing prides itself on, and rightly so, rightly so, is we pride ourselves in remembering our Christian tradition, the fact that everything we have, everything we believe in, everything that's good about this country ultimately rests on that building block of Judeo-Christian ideas and Christ himself and on, on the things that he preached. And a lot of these right wingers, a lot of these uh, uh, alt-right Nazis say, well, we believe we don't believe in Jesus, but we believe in the tradition of Christianity. Well, no, they don't. You know, no, they don't. Look, look you cannot, you cannot believe that man is made in the image of God. The world is a bit easing. It's a wonderful day. Hooray, hooray. It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, hooray. So this is why we can't have nice things. We're one clavenless weekend and we have Nazis and communists fighting with each other. Come on. Come on. You know, I go away for three days. It's like... I cannot leave anymore. All right, we got Michael Knowles is going to come on. He has done a lot of uh, work reading and writing about the alt-right, so he's going to talk to us about the roots and get to the, the depth of it. But first, let us pause before we get into this obviously depressing topic to talk about something that is good about our country, namely Stamps.com, because Stamps.com makes it so you don't have to go and wait online in front of the post office. An organization which we should mention does a really good job, the post office. The only problem is it's a little bit old fashioned to have to get in your car, drive to the post office, stand there waiting online to get things that stamps.com will put directly into your computer. With stamps.com, you bring all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale, which automatically automatically calculates exact postage and stamps.com will even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. Right now, you can enjoy the stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long term commitments. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Clavin. What's a Clavin? <laughs> now you're asking the tough questions. A Clavin, it's a Chinese mind disaster. That's K L A V A N. Stamps.com. Enter Clavin. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Terrific product. Good thing to have. Ugly, ugly stuff. All right. Terrific. You know, one of, one of the things, one of the reasons I say that politics is frequently the opposite of religion or the opposite of spiritual wisdom is because it convinces us that the most important thing we have to do is focus on the sins of our opposition. And of course, those of you who read the gospel will know that we are instructed very carefully, pay attention to what's going on with you. And so I see all the stuff that's going on. I see the press using this to attack Trump. I see the press, uh, the, the politicians, you know, coming on, putting their fat faces on TV and trying to use evil in this death that took place. Uh, and uh, these deaths, I should say, that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia, and trying to use it to their advantage. I see that they treat the Nazi terrorists differently than they treat Muslim terrorists. I see that there's all kind of hypocrisy coming from the left. And I get that. And I'm going to talk about all of it. And that's especially obvious questions answered, your personal problems solved. And if you subscribe for a year, it allows you 100 bucks for the year. You get the leftist tears tumbler. Come on. It's worth it. All right, let's, uh, we'll, we'll see you on the other side. All right, Knowles, have we got him? The great and powerful Michael Knowles. There we are. Hey, it's good to see you. You know, I have to thank you. You have uh -oh. you have given me some really terrible assignments before <laughs> Southside with you, yeah. Barry, so on. Yeah. I'm I'm really glad you did not send me to Charlottesville this weekend. <laughs> that would have just that would have been worse than Southside with you. That's so probably, I I just like to thank you on the show. It would have been it would have been a toss up, Southside or you, or having <laughs> yeah. your head cracked in by a That's bunch true. of crazy. That's true. Fair people. enough. <laughs> how's how's your show going? The uh, show's going well. I yeah. want to thank everybody for listening. We rose up pretty high in the 
charts and have been doing shockingly well. I figured we would have been canceled by now, but thanks to viewers like you, somehow I, I, I still have a job. I've, I've tried my best to get you canceled. And, <laughs> and, and that I have to remind people, you have to go on. You cannot let this man. Look, look at this guy's face. Look at this mug. You cannot let this man rise above my show. <laughs> and it's all about the reviews. you got to go on iTunes and review my show and give it good reviews so you can humiliate this man as he this, so, obvi so obviously deserves. Don't I mean, you? <laughs> <laughs> so you have written a lot and, and wrote, you wrote a really excellent piece. A, a long time, a while back, for the Daily Wire about these. Uh, what do we call them? I, I almost hate to call them the alt right because it doesn't mean anything. The, the word has been watered down to mean nothing. Yeah. They've sort of done it. It's a weird alliance between these guys and the media to make this term so ambiguous that they pull people in. And this this is the cleverness of them. It's why they called their rally "Unite the Right." Hmm. This rally was just neo Confederates, neo Nazis, white nationalists. Very, they're very a small group of people and centered around those ideas, but they called it Unite the Right because then people like Richard Spencer and so on get to mainstream themselves and insinuate themselves in the conservative movement that booted them out 50 years ago. Right. We, they did, right? This is These are the guys that William Buckley chased out of the temple, basically. That's right. And they've always been around a little bit. You know, the uh, Buckley purged them, purged the Bershers and, and other racists and anti-Semites. And they've kind of come back a little bit. You know, there was always this Buchananism toyed around with this a lot. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of other people, John Derbyshire has written racist articles. Yep. Uh, uh, Peter Brimelow has veered into that territory. And for decades now, there have been people like Jared Taylor, my fellow Yale, who's a white supremacist, white, white nationalist, I think is fair. He is uh, unique, I think, among them because he's actually not anti-Semitic. He's just a ethno-state advocate and wants a white country and all those sort of things. Uh, not The same cannot be said of some of these other guys. There's Theodore Beale who goes... But, but, let us start among ourselves, because we're all good conservatives here. Let us gather together and just remind ourselves, these clowns are in our house, okay? These evil, satanic clowns are in our house. And it's no good saying, it's no good saying, well, they don't believe what they believe. Of course they don't believe what we believe. Of course they don't. They don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe in e pluribus unum. They don't believe in the great American tradition of bringing people in and transforming them into America through our creed that, that we conservatives are fighting so hard to defend. They don't, they don't believe in low taxes. They don't believe in any of, these, any of this stuff. They don't believe in America. They don't believe in the whole thing that makes America what it is. But they're in our house. They identify themselves as right wing. They vote for the people we vote for. They have their slogans, unite the right and all this stuff. It's no good. You know, when the devil is in your house, you got to take care of that. It's no good saying, well, the devil is in the other guy's house too. Of course he is. But let's not mince words about it. And, and by the way, by the way, one of the things I think the right wing prides itself on and rightly so, rightly so, is we pride ourselves in remembering our Christian tradition, the fact that everything we have, everything we believe in, everything that's good about this country ultimately rests on that building block of Judeo-Christian ideas and Christ himself and on, on the things that he preached. And a lot of these right-wingers, a lot of these uh, uh, alt-right Nazis say, well, we, believe, we don't believe in Jesus, but we believe in the tradition of Christianity. Well, no, they don't. You know, no, they don't. Look, look you, cannot, you cannot believe that man is made in the image of God. You cannot believe that the Lord came and said in so many words, here are the commandments. Here are the two big commandments. Love God. And here's the next one, because it's right next to it, is love your neighbor as yourself and then become a racist. You're just, you cannot go around telling God what his image should look like. Okay. So these guys violate everything that we are. They are evil and they violate every, and they stand for evil and they violate everything that we are. And we and they're in our house. They are in our house. So okay, we're going to talk about the left. We're going to talk about all the hypocritical and nasty things they do. But let's not mince words about it. Okay, this these guys need to be swept out, and they need to be discarded, and they need to we need to turn our back on them and walk away. And by the way, you know, if if in some moment of anger, if in some moment of personal uh, you know problems or something, something they've said has. Uh, made sense to you, or you've gone online and said something that sort of links you to them. That was yesterday. Today, walk away. Walk away. This is, these guys are not the good guys. They are the bad guys, and they're in our house. We have to reject them. So what happened? Uh, you know, let's just go quickly over this thing. They have us a, a 
Park in Charlottesville. This is not uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. This is Charlottesville, Virginia, which has that beautiful, uh, that's where UVA is, and it? it's a beautiful. Conservative movement that booted them out 50 years ago. Right. We, they did, right? This is These are the guys that William Buckley chased out of the temple, basically. That's right. And they've always been around a little bit. You know, the uh, Buckley purged them, purged the Bershers and, and other racists and anti-Semites. And they've all kind of come back a little bit. You know, there was always this Buchananism toyed around with this a lot. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of other people, John Derbyshire has written racist articles. Yep. Uh, uh, Peter Brimelow has veered into that territory. And for decades now, there have been people like Jared Taylor, my fellow Yale, who's a white supremacist, white white nationalist, I think is fair. He is uh, unique, I think, among them because he's actually not anti-Semitic. He's just a ethno state advocate and wants a white country and all those sort of things. Uh, not the same cannot be said of some of these other guys. There's Theodore Beale, who goes by Vox Day. Oh yeah, he, he's one. He he utters the 14 words about protecting white people. What, and are, what are the 14 words? The 14 words are. Let me see if I remember this from summer camp. Okay. It's uh, <laughs> we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. It's often paired with 88, which stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet H, which stands for Heil Hitler, of course. Oh great. Okay. Uh, and and other writers too. Sam Francis, the old right wing writer, he called for a white racial consciousness. Paul Ramsey is a YouTube guy, white supremacist, questions the Holocaust. Uh, What's really interesting about these guys is just like the progressives, they're going backwards. You know, they're going back to this primitive idea. I mean, ever since Jesus, basically, the idea has been that we, that great ideas transcend nationalism and transcend race, at least since Jesus, it's been that idea. They're going back into this primitivism. These guys are evidence that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. This is <laughs> yeah, the, seriously, yeah. because they're not totally stupid and they're not totally uneducated. They are a little bit stupid and lightly educated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've read some things, but not but without a lot of context. They position themselves as defenders of Western culture, Western civilization. I think they know very little about those two things. And as, as a result, their views can seem attractive. A guy like Richard Spencer, who's kind of become the head of this thing, he runs altright.com, the National Policy Institute, which is white nationalist. He's a good looking guy, he's articulate, and he seems educated to the uneducated. Uh -huh. He's not a stupid guy. He was in a PhD program at Duke, and that that's what that's what's worrisome. It's, it's David Duke University, right? That's David Duke oh, University. Oh, no, actually, right. other Duke. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, yeah it's a correspondence course. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, but with, with, it, it's attractive, it's subtle, it's uh, tempting, much like the devil. So it's very, you know, confuses <laughs> right. information right. that way. And as a result, I think, particularly young people, particularly uh, that right-wing set of internet trolls, can be brought over to them. You know, Andrew Anglin, the guy who runs Daily Storm, or this disgusting website, which is just a neo Ku Klux Klan thing, those two things. And as, as a result, their views can seem attractive. A guy like Richard Spencer, who's kind of become the head of this thing, he runs altright.com, the National Policy Institute, which is white nationalist. He's a good looking guy, he's articulate, and he seems educated to the uneducated. Uh -huh. He's not a stupid guy. He was in a PhD program at Duke, and that that's what that's what's worrisome. It's, it's David Duke University, right? That's David Duke University. Oh, oh no, University. Like the other right. Duke. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a correspondence course, anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But with what it, it's attractive, it's subtle, it's uh, tempting, much like the devil. So it's very, you know confuses <laughs> right. information right. that way, and as a result, I think particularly young people, particularly uh, that right wing set of internet trolls can be brought over to them. You know, Andrew Anglin, the guy who runs Daily Storm, or this disgusting website, which is just a neo Ku Klux Klan thing, he says that he's the king of the trolls, which makes this fight personal, buddy. Absolutely. Because back when you were just neo-Nazis, I was angry. But now you're claiming my people. This is <laughs> not good. You are. Listen, I think we all acknowledge that you are king of the trolls. I appreciate This is it. like Game of Thrones. You guys are going to have to fight it out with, like, dragons. When two ethereal armies go to <laughs> battle, particularly with dragons, side with Michael. Always right. side with Michael. <laughs> you know right. how the story turns out. <laughs> so, that, But there's this worry. That some young people went to this stupid thing in Charlottesville. There's a guy, he's a college president, college Republican president at Washington State University, James Alsip. He's a YouTuber guy. He went there in, in solidarity with these guys. He's the, the guy who mowed down the poor woman and 19 other people was 20 years old, right. threw his life away, probably had more testosterone than sense. And, and the other strange thing about this movement is that it's not just hillbillies. 
It, you know, of the, course, of course. Yeah. There are a lot of risks. A Andrew Anglin, the Storm Tr Daily Stormer guy, says that he his largest source of traffic and donations is Silicon Valley. Really? It's not Appalachian. Now, who knows? I mean, the guy's a liar and a troll, yeah, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. There are these roots of neo-reaction that came out of Silicon so, Valley. So wait, let's talk about the young the young aspect of this for a minute. Sure. Though, because I, I, have to, I have to believe, I mean, I, I, obviously there's no study of it, but I have to believe that part of the appeal to young people is shattering the pieties. I mean, when you see a guy... Uh, fired from Google for basically saying, hey, could you please allow a little bit of uh, alternate opinions in here? And they go, yeah, you're fired. That that there, it becomes, I mean, I always used to say this about John Derbyshire too, is that it, it becomes glamorous to fight the power. I mean, it's kind of like Satan in Paradise Lost. You know, he's up against this massive power. It becomes kind of romantic to precisely. stand up against it, even if you're utterly in the wrong. That's precisely right. And I think that I don't think we should condescend and patronize these young people and say, oh, you've got a lot to learn, young fella. Mm -hmm. And but if white people are supposed to stop identifying as white, are black people supposed to stop identifying as black? Because if black people stop identifying as black, the Democratic Party would disappear. If the Democratic Party could stop would stop convincing people to identify according to their race and according to their sex and according to their identity, the Democrat Party would disappear. Its policies don't work. Its cities are cesspools for the people they're supposed to help. I mean, go on, look online at any place where uh, blacks are being shot down, where they're living in squalor, where they're living in desperate situations. See who's been running that city since like, you know, 1203, you know, the, these places like Chicago, Baltimore, St. Louis, you know, they almost never have Republican governors or mayors. You know, that the fact that this philosophy, this progressive Democrat socialist philosophy has failed everywhere and has failed the people it's supposed to help is very, very well established. So the only thing they have is this grievance politics. Why on earth, why on earth would Black Lives Matter I mean, if you if you if a Democrat politician stands up and he says all lives matter, he gets shouted down. We've seen it. He gets booed off the stage. So what is it that makes Richard Spencer and these white Nazis? What is it that deprives them of their legitimacy in that world? What is it once you say that black people have a right to rise up as black people? Why don't white people have a right to rise up as white people? You are eating the results of your own logic. I mean, it is. Was it Antonin Scalia who said that uh, if you want to get rid of racist you know, preferences, you have to stop referring people on the basis of races? He was attacking affirmative action. Of course, affirmative action is wrong. Of course, it's wrong. It's wrong. See, this is the problem with the left. We're always talking about whether things work or not. They always have us in these kind of uh, conversations about, well, does this improve things? Does this make life better? Does socialism make life fair? Socialism is wrong per se because the government has no right to take your property. It's your property. It has no right. It's stealing. Just because the government does it doesn't make it any less stealing. It is wrong per se. Racism is wrong per se. Identifying people according to their color of their skin is wrong per se. We who believe in God know why it's wrong, but everybody knows it's wrong. We know why it's wrong. We know we were made in the image of God. We know the image of God has different colors, has different races, comes from different places. We know that we are meant to love one another. We know because we are people who believe in God. But even if you don't believe, you know, you know this to be true down in your heart that the, the idea of attacking somebody, not for what he does, but for what he is, is wrong. So why is it that the left has been allowed to mainstream this idea? If a white cop kills a black guy, it's immediately a racial issue. But who says it was? Who says it was? You know, how do you, do you have proof? Do you have evidence that he was a racist? Instead, they have accepted, I've said this before. For listening, we rose up pretty high in the charts and have been doing shockingly well. I figured we would have been canceled by now, but thanks to viewers like you, somehow I, I still I, have a job. I've, I've tried my best to get you canceled. And, <laughs> and, and that I have to remind people, you have to go on, you cannot let this man, look, look at this guy's face. Look at this he, mug. You cannot let this man rise above my show. <laughs> and it's all about the reviews. You gotta go on iTunes and review my show and give it good reviews so you can, humiliate this man as he this, so, obvi so obviously deserves. I mean, you? <laughs> <laughs> so you have written a lot and, and wrote, you wrote a really excellent piece uh, a long time, a while back for the Daily Wire about these, uh, what do we call them? I, I almost hate to call them the alt-right because it doesn't mean anything. The, the word has been watered down to mean nothing. Yeah. They've sort of done it. It's a weird alliance between these guys and the media to 
make this term so ambiguous that they pull people in. And this, this is the cleverness of them. It's why they called their rally Unite the Right. Hmm. This rally was just neo-Confederates, neo-Nazis, white nationalists. Very, they're very a small group of people and centered around those ideas. But they called it Unite the Right because then people like Richard Spencer and so on get to mainstream themselves and insinuate hmm. themselves in the conservative movement that booted them out 50 years ago. Right. We, they did, right? This is, these are the guys that William Buckley chased out of the temple, basically. That's right. And they've always been around a little bit. You know, the uh, Buckley purged them, purged the Bershers and, and other racists and anti-Semites. And they've all kind of come back a little bit. You know, there was always this Buchananism toyed around with this a lot. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of other people, John Derbyshire has written racist articles. Yep. Uh, uh, Peter Brimelow has veered into that territory. And for decades now, there have been people like Jared Taylor, my fellow Yale, who's a white supremacist, white, white nationalist, I think is fair. He is uh, unique, I think, among them because he's actually not anti-Semitic. He's just a ethno-state advocate and wants a white country and all those sort of things. Uh, not The same cannot be said of some of these other guys. There's Theodore Beale, who goes by Vox Day. Oh, yeah. He, he's one. He, he utters the 14 words about protecting white people. What, and are, what are the 14 words? The 14 words are, let me see if I remember this from summer camp. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. It's often paired with 88, which stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet H, which stands for Heil Hitler, of course. Oh, great, okay. Uh, and, and other writers too. Sam Francis, the old right-wing writer, he called for a white racial consciousness. Paul Ramsey is a YouTube guy, white supremacist, questions the Holocaust. Uh, What's really interesting about these guys is just like the progressives, they're going backwards. You know, they're going back to this primitive idea. I mean, ever since Jesus, basically, the idea has been that we that great ideas transcend nationalism and transcend race. At least since Jesus, it's been that idea. They're going back into this primitivism. These guys are evidence that a little bit of knowledge is